My name is Love Emisa. Um, I'm an interpreter at the same time, civil servant. Well, my name is Clement Sam, and I am an interpreter. And I also work with the um, Parliament of Ghana as a professional sign language interpreter. I learned it at church, Church of Christ, on Sunday Road. When I saw my pastor signing to the congregation, so I told my mom, I want to learn this language. So my mom introduced me to the pastor, Sam, um, Sam Williams, and then he, he trained me on in the he trained me on um, sign language, and then after some after six months, he, um, a deaf person, he's late. He took over and then started training me, and then I did further workshops training with NAD, Ghana National Association of the, the of the Deaf, with NAD, and then I took it from there. Well, there was this guy in my neighborhood. Um, I don't know where he is now. It's called Mauli. And this guy will go to the cinema and watch a movie and come back home. You don't need to go watch it, but listen to him. Very animated. He will tell you the story from A to Z and you understand everything. He couldn't speak, he couldn't hear, but he will dramatize and let you know how Jackie Chan was able to you know, defeat the opponent, how Arnold Schwarzenegger in acting as commando was coming out with his guns and everything. This guy was so animated, so it got me curious. I was asking myself, is there sign representation for every word we spoke in, in, in our language? And that got me really um, into it. But with time, because he left the neighborhood, um, that, that zeal faded away until I had the real opportunity to work in a pharmaceutical company where, you know, as part of giving back to society, They've employed a lot of deaf people in that pharmaceutical company. And that was it. I, I saw them in real life, you know, communicating every day. And that interest sparked again. I said, wow, this is something I wanted to do back in the day. The opportunity has presented itself. I want to take advantage of it. And, you know, I got close to them. I started learning. It was difficult in the beginning because you understand, it's a company. When anything happens and you know sign language, they come calling you, hey, be the interpreter, explain to us what they were saying and what have you. So it, it, it was a little bit of a difficulty for the deaf people to, to teach us, you know, those hearing people in the company. But with determination and resilience, I, I got closer and closer and then I made a friend with one of them and that was it. He taught me everything. Um, he gave me booklets. I went home, learned everything, came back to work, and I stopped, you know, writing back and forth. We're signing, you know, basically. So it was that fast. Put together, it will be uh, 20 years. It is very difficult to learn, but I think. It depends on the individual involved. Just like any other language you're learning. If, you know, there are people who frown upon French in school. Ah, no, French, no, 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 no. When they see me say, they, they, are, they, are, they are upset. They don't want to see the French teacher in class. So, but there are others who love French. They want to see me say, come in there. It is the same thing. Yeah, I started learning the sign language um, since, I think, 1995. 1995, 1995, then I was in <clears throat> JSS. My mom was okay. My mom was okay with, um, of, my mom was okay, but my siblings were like, hey, you go deaf when you start learning, when you start signing with them. If you mingle with them, you're going to become deaf and stuff. But I told them, it's either I, I want to learn it. I, I, love, I love to sign and I want to be with them. So if I go deaf, it's, it's, it's natural. They are deaf and they are human. So what if I go deaf? And they were like, no, they don't come closer to me. Some friends will not even allow you to come closer to them. So they think if you learn the sign language, you become deaf and then when they are closer to you, so 
Because I had some small challenges. The support was uh, massive because, look, when I was learning in the family, people were learning different languages, okay, but I chose to learn sign language. But they did not see what I wanted to use it for, you know. And it was funny when I'm practicing before the mirror, he'll come in and creep, hey, what are you doing? You know, be careful you don't go mad, you know. But um, when they realized that people, you know, deaf friends started visiting me at home and were striking very good conversation and they realized, mm, this guy is really making amends. He's really improving whatever he's doing. Um, yes, you know, in the community, I did not get that labeling from my siblings. Um, but in the community, um, they, I remember one, one time, one person had to go and tell my dad, hey, you need to talk to your son. Eh? He's going off the way, you know. Um, when he continues to associate with this, these people, you will never know. You can't tell. Maybe growing up, you will become one of them, you know. But my father is that type who doesn't really force you to do what he wants you to do. You know, we had that freedom in the house to explore and learn other things apart from what your dad wants you to learn at school. It was bad, bad experience. Um, one of our colleagues um, from Paul Manson was to interpret for GTV, um, meet the press. He traveled for, he traveled, so he asked me to go and interpret for him. And then, I didn't know then, I didn't know that when you are interpreting, you have to look into the camera. So I was just looking around like this. I was just doing my own thing. So people called him and were saying, ah, what's she doing? She's, just, she's not looking into the camera, what's she doing? So when she came back, she was like, ah, why, why did you do that? I said, you didn't tell me that when I'm, because um, at church, when you're signing, you can look anywhere, you can look around. But I didn't know that when you're signing on tell, you have to look straight into the camera so you don't get distracted. So it was a flop. I, I, I really mess up. There was this um, program, ABC of HIV AIDS. Yeah. Did you see that one? Yes. Did you see my face? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first time on TV. It was on Metro TV, actually. And um, I did an introduction after uh, days of practice, <laughs> days of rehearsals. I did that and um, it was, and I was with the, with the presenter of Missing Link, you know, back in the days, the 90s, um, the late Francis Boyson. So we did that, that thing together and it was, it was quite, quite a moment for me. Um, I did not see it as um, something that I fulfilled. I did not see what I've done and the impact until that thing was shown on television for the first time. It was a Saturday, I remember clearly. And subsequently, you know, the, the calls were not even coming to me. It, it went to my father. His friends, you know, would call him and say, oh, I saw your son on television, blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. So how did he learn these things? How? how? Has he gone to school for days? How did he? Because we see him around and we don't see him go. He never told us he was going to school to learn, you know, sign language. But that was it. That was the first time. And the feeling was good, um, especially so because I was with someone who, you know, growing up, I was watching him on TV doing missing link. Apparently, because of what he did, people mistaking sign language to be missing link. But that was just a title of a program. When the COVID-19 uh, started spreading here in Ghana, uh, I remember we, the Ghana Health Service, um, had a, a sort of a mini workshop for, for the interpreters in basically Accra, just to see how we can also use our skill to get the message over to them um, anytime there is information. So after that particular press, um, that particular um, workshop, we, I was home 
one Sunday morning and I had a, a call from their director that hey there's going to be a, a press briefing on COVID-19 at the Ministry of Information and like we said um, we'd like you to go out there and you know use your skill to also interpret what is it and I did uh, go there and uh, subsequently uh, it's been mostly on a weekly basis anytime there is uh, an update we together with um, love we are called to go out there and you know interpret so it's been quite a journey it's been really amazing and especially so because we used to have we used to to be in the box all the time but this time uh, we are huge enough uh, that a deaf person can access us on their phone their laptops their whatever ipads and everything so uh, again a very good thing was defeated the idea that people are being discriminated against deaf people felt that way so they had to fight for that so once they saw us standing next to the to the speakers it is it was as if they, they achieved a target okay because everything was just at the right time the same time we were hearing and listening and getting the information on COVID-19 they were also getting it at the same time you know some time ago it would have been recorded then inserted sign language interpreter will be inserted but this time it was concurrently happening at the same time so that was a plus and I would say that that too will go to the credit of the Ministry of Information they listened that hey this is the new directive so you need to also apply it from the WHO and they listened there were no problems they understood the point and that is how it's going so now deaf people are receiving the message at the right time the signs are big enough you can sit in the comfort of your home or you can pick your phone check on Facebook live you can stream it and watch it so when there is any news on the COVID-19 a deaf person can just take the phone check in there and everything will be in sign language so I think it's a great great plus for the Ministry of Information the Ghana Health Service and the Ministry of Health for bringing that uh, great idea on board it's been great and you know Ghanaians some will give you bad <laughs> some will insult you and a whole, some funny 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 comments but sometimes it read it um, it encourages you to do better because in those words whatever you do you get the negative and the positive so comment so you see i it's a concern and we are glad that people are concerned about our health but you know what when it comes to sign language and sign language interpretation okay it's more like um you use your mouth to talk but you are going to deliver a speech where your mouth is closed how are you going to talk for your audience to understand you at the end of the day because when you open your mouth you inhale particles you are not supposed to inhale and so you close your mouth and not be able to deliver so yes we, we, we've had concerns from people who genuinely think about us but here is the thing we also proposed a solution okay where those who are involved in making masks would also create a transparent one for us as interpreters because at arm's length we we are still close to the main speakers and that concern heightened when one person who had recovered you know was there uh, and he was sharing his experiences and I was very close to the person very close to the person that day and I saw on, on Lau's face she was sitting in the audience and she was like blinking telling me go a step away you know I was very very close that day but I didn't feel that that fear if he's gone there and he's back it's okay but I was so much involved in doing my work and especially the information is given was so important that I need not miss any of the information I need to get everything he was saying so I can also at the same time relay the information quickly to the deaf community that was so important because whatever is done and it's out of the place 
they need to get that exact information and because he was wearing the nose mask you know when i go a step away i will lose a lot of the information so i need to get closer and that was when the concerns came so we mentioned it to um, a company that came there they are into mask making we mentioned it to them and we told them what was being done internationally um, there are transparent masks and we showed them a couple of pictures we sent it to them and they promised to make us transparent mask up until now we've not received them however i've spoken to a friend who is into local mask making and i've given her the dimensions and whatever so hopefully maybe at the next uh, briefing or the subsequent ones you may see us in something quite strange you know um and we know that we also solicit some comments from <laughs> you people there here in community everything you see you talk about it <laughs> let me add up um you know the deaf people though they listen with their um with their eyes and then we sign with our hands sometimes some of them lip read so maybe if they are not getting from what you are saying through your hand they will rip your lip and then it's, they will get the information that you are trying to give it to them and then if we cover our mouth it's impossible it's not possible for them to know what we are trying to say sometimes we miss a word and then when they read our lips they will know that oh this is what the person is trying to sign then they will get the info here in ghana whenever there is going to be a presentation or um should I say presentation, they will not give it to you. Maybe someone might, might think, oh, she will go and leak the information before the speaker comes. So I, I'll rather keep it to myself. When it's time for me to go and interpret, then hey, when it's time for me to go and give the speech, then she can follow me. And then some, sometimes too, they don't, should I use this word? They don't respect us with the interpreters. They think, oh, you just come there and show your hands. What's so special about this thing? You just show your hands and you think you're doing something. And they don't know that we go through a lot to bring out the information because you say something i have to process it in my mind before i'll give it out and they think oh it's just something that you show your hands and that is all sometimes even they don't want to give you anything they'll just say oh but you didn't do anything you just came and show your hands and that is it and i'm hoping that one day one day they will realize that we mean a lot when there is for example the news there's no way you can go on air without preparing. So you get all these information, you read about it, you, you listen to the voiceovers and everything. So to keep you in shape, you are not surprised on set. So that is one. But for um, live programs where you have somebody delivering a speech, um, sometimes you don't have enough time to even meet the person, let alone asking for the person's speech. And so what you have to we do normally is that we, we try to imagine uh, what is going to happen. And if a producer who called you is still available, you want to find out from the person what is the program about? What are they likely to talk about? Then with these little information, you can do a, a research about it and you know get something so that when you go, that person who is speaking and does not even think about you as an interpreter uh, will not surprise you. And we've I've had occasions where uh, someone was delivering a speech and he started using terms, huge ones. It was a medical conference and the terms were just coming here and there. But so I, I was I was still flowing with, with the with the speaker and he looked at me uh, wondering whether I really understood what he was saying. And he wanted to ask me, so he asked me a question whether I understand him. And I signed in my interpreting that he's asking whether I understand. He wanted me to stop. I said no, I kept on so whatever he tells me, I wouldn't reply, I will sign in you know so because that is my work if you want to find out about me before the program or after the program you have that liberty so you want to find out hey did you really get what i was saying you know and that would be more appropriate but sometimes like love said they they tend to think that well 
uh, he's just an interpreter. So is he really sure of what he's doing? Is he really telling the story how it's supposed to be told? I can't remember when I did the first um, presidential address. And people were saying, oh, she's not doing anything. She's just showing her hands, just like what the man did at South Africa. And I was like, hey, you don't even understand the language. If someone did this, doesn't mean I'm doing the same thing. People think we, we are not doing the right thing, though they don't understand. They think we are not doing the right thing, so we are just showing our hands because I don't know. I don't know what they think, but it's unfortunate because of one someone's misfortune. Now it it, it affects us, and it has affected me because when the president was these people were giving me bad comments, and when you read your comment, it's like hey. But when sometimes it it, it encourages me. It really encouraged me. I was encouraged to do more, to learn more. A friend called me. I said Charlie. Why are you there? You know they hear what they happen. I said, ah, what? I said, ah! Charlie, you go your work there. Somebody's Paul and for South Africa. I said, how is that? So I checked quickly. I said, oh. Charlie, headlines, serious headlines. Oh. It was everywhere. In fact, he marred that, that day for Mandela. Mandela was supposed to be the icon. This guy stole the show with this with this thing but apparently later it was discovered that he had issues health issues so it was not directly linked to his job but you know he had serious health issues that you shouldn't shouldn't go for a job of this magnitude when you are having these underlining factors health issues he's far away in south africa it affected us here in ghana and i remember um, a couple of weeks later, after that bombshell, um, I was at the Accra International Conference Center. There was going to be a launch of a program, and it was, I think, one president, John Mahama, um, His Excellency. He was there to deliver a 30 minute speech, and I was only supposed to interpret that one. I was standing next to him. So they showed me to, they did a needful. They showed me to the security. Hey, when he goes up there, this man is coming up. Don't stop him. So they checked everything. I was cleared. So he went there, he was there, and I climbed up the stage, stood next to him. Then he, he turned <laughs> and he looked at me. You know, he said, I hope you're Ghanaian. And I said, Yes. <laughs> okay, I don't want any South African here. You know, it was funny. We all cracked over it and the audience were, you know, laughing. But at the end of the day, it tells you that everybody is aware of what is going on. So if you are on that big stage and you do anything contrary to what, you know, people know, then you, you keep, you, you put the rest of your colleagues into the same soup. We have videos. Um, anytime WHO releases a, a video on COVID-19 education, then we have a team that works on that video. Uh, and that team members, there are some who are deaf, you know, and they work on it together with hearing interpreters. We, we brainstorm on some of the terms because um, COVID-19 is new to all of us. So uh, when you talk about lockdown, you talk about social distances these are new terms to everyone and in sign language with their new terms actually and covid 19 coronavirus these are all new terms so there should be a sign identifying coronavirus or a lockdown or a quarantine or um, isolation social distancing all these should have specific signs so that committee will sit down and look at it and you know get a video done appropriately and there is an interpreter on it uh, big enough so the deaf community can see it and we do it and circulate it in on platforms where deaf people are so they can access the information because sometimes if you have to wait for let's say ministry of health to tell you to do it or the ministry of information to tell you to do it hey you need to bring a budget let, no 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 it will be too late so we quickly do something and put it out there for them to you know get that information 
at the same time that we, the hearing community, are receiving that kind of information. Just as we are also curious about, oh, oh, is there a vaccine? <laughs> they are concerned whether uh, what is preventing people from the scientists. What what are they doing? Because the last time I heard they were close to discovering a vaccine. What happened? They kept on asking, asking, asking. Anytime they meet an interpreter, especially the two of us, because we get close to events, they want to find out. Uh, so what is it? We've not found the vaccine. When is the president going to give the next update? And what, what are the possible things the president is going to say? Is there going to be an extension of a lockdown? You know, all these things. But they forget we are interpreters. Sometimes this information <laughs> comes late. So they are so much concerned about what is going on. They want to find out. And genuinely, everybody is worried about COVID-19. But here is the twist. People assume that, uh, okay, they are deaf people. They've been educated, they've gone to school. But so when they see subtitles, they see pictures and everything, they should be able to understand. Because some of the WHO videos and the Ministry of Health and Ghana Health Service videos, there are pictures there. And no, they should look at it. Why, why the need for an interpreter? So I ask them, you know, there are people in England um, who presumably should, should speak English and understand English and write English. But there are people you meet in England, uh, they can't read and write. Okay, they can't read and write, but they speak English. They can't read and write, but they speak English. How is that? That is the language they use in their everyday community. Apart from English, what else do they speak there? They don't. So there are deaf people who can read and write. They are bilingual <laughs> deaf people. But their language actually is sign language. So let's say 90% um, um, of deaf people can get information or access information in sign language, whereas only 10% are bilingual. That is why we've been, um, the COVID-19 thing, you see us all the time in there. Because if one deaf person gets it, it's going to be disastrous for Ghanaians. Because first of all, you can't even communicate with him. How would you get to know he's gotten it? He will sit down there, his parents will come and hug him, touch his forehead oh your temperature and you touch your forehead you touch your nose you also get it and keeps on spreading can you imagine how many people are going to get um, the coronavirus in the community that is why information is very important don't think the deaf person cannot do anything on their own they are capable of doing so many things and so many wonderful things. And I'm pleading with all, uh, the public that they should learn the basics. Sign language. You can go to NAD office, Ghana National Association of the Deaf. They can go to their office. They can go to Church of Christ. Any of the Churches of Christ, they train sign language interpreters. They can go to Nutford University. They can go to Winneba and then they can go to UCC to learn or they can even come to our association. What I want to say is that sign language is a beautiful language and it doesn't take much to learn it. I want to encourage everyone watching us to, to make it a point to want to have basic communication skills in sign language. Try getting a deaf friend, befriend a deaf person, have interaction with a deaf person, get to know what a deaf person thinks about you. Once you know their basic signs, you will be able to have a meaningful communication with them.